Witchside Podcast is a proud member of the Witchside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to us by Brandon Mullins again. Brandon, I still love you. Brandon says, We had the most amazing time at a vegan bed and breakfast called The Ginger Cat. Jita Devi is the proprietress, and she has a long history of animal activism. We recommend it highly to any vegans planning a trip to Watkins Glen, New York, slash Farm Sanctuary area. That sounds... I've never been to a vegan bed and breakfast, but I would love to go. So you just gave me a bucket list item to go visit that bed and breakfast. Yeah, I would love to go to a vegan bed and breakfast. Oh, God, yeah. That would be so cool. Yeah. I thought about starting one, but it's like... Do you really have that clientele? And oh yeah, the work behind it and mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. you have to love it. But that's awesome. I'm gonna check that out. If you guys want to give a shout out to something you love or an organization you're part of, or just because you want to be awesome and support the podcast, all we ask is you donate ten dollars, which I podcast.com, and we'll say whatever you want, just like we did for Brandon, because we fucking love him. I'm going to serenade you again because I know that you like it. Witchsidepodcast.com This is episode 107. Or the second installment of Witchside Lectures. Who do we have on this, this installment? Dane Rossman. And he talks about his extradition to Canada. If you want to be a part of the Witchside Lectures, super easy. All you have to do is just get permission from uh, the presenter, record the speech, send it to us. We'll do all the editing. We'll give you your credit. But it's just a good way of getting these these speeches, sometimes impromptu, sometimes that will never happen again, distributed to the masses. And also, if you're a lecturer yourself and you have previously recorded speeches or video, just send them to us and we'll get them out for you. Yeah, totally. We want to make this shit real. What news and events do we have going on this week? Fucking Fur Free Friday. Fucking Fur Free Friday? Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's going to be on Friday. It is. The day after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It is also known as the International don't shop day or something i always remember of the house getting raided by fbi day that's a fun one to look at yeah um check out local animal rights organizations in your area if no one's doing a fur free friday in the area that you live in do it do do it it yourself. yourself um just do it go to a fur farm do it if it's legal to protest in front of the fur farm just do do it if you don't have a fur farm you have fur stores go to fur stores people who sell fur or i mean quite honestly anywhere public gathering you can educate people over the horrors of the the fur industry it's pretty simple to do if you do one of these uh impromptu you know demonstrations because you don't have one let us know we'll give you a shout out let everyone know that you're the awesomest of the awesome in your area because you're the only one doing shit november 27th 1920 Trotsky ordered attacks and raids on anarchists throughout Russia fuck you Trotsky fuck you fuck you Trotsky why would he do that because all communists will eventually try to kill anarchists it's just their nature it's why they can't be trusted well that's why I don't work with them that's why that's why we don't work with commies goddamn commie bastards enjoy but if you do like these slingshots every week we pull them out of the slingshot personal organizer you get one at your local info shop if you don't have a local info shop get one at an online info shop like ak press hope you enjoy Tucson, Arizona. Um, 
We've got a few projects there, mostly Tucson Anarchist Black Cross right now. Um, I'm going to talk about being extradited to Canada. Um, there's an audio recording thing happening, just so people know. Um, uh, a few disclaimers. I'm not a good public speaker, um, so if anything sounds like scattered or it's confusing, feel free to like ask questions. Um, also, generally, feel free to ask questions or add comments at any time if you feel like it, because there's kind of a lot in here, and knowing what people would kind of want to focus on is actually really useful, and then we can talk more about those things. Um, and also, comments that aren't for clarification, but if there are things going on here in Salt Lake that are like relevant to stuff that we're talking about, I'm like really interested in hearing about those things generally. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, I live in Tucson. In 2010, I decided that it would be a very good idea to go to the G20 Summit in Toronto. At the time, I was living in New York. Um, does everybody know what the G20 is? Does anybody not know what the G20 is? Um, they're an organization, I'll give some background anyway. They're an organization of, I think it's the 17 largest economies, excluding countries like Iran or Venezuela. Um, and the IMF, World Bank, and the EU as a representative. Um, and they came to prominence around the time of the 2008 economic crisis and sort of supplanted the G8 around that time. Um, but they get together and they try to coordinate policies internationally, particularly economic policy. Um, they had their summit in Toronto in 2010. Um, and the security infrastructure was like massive. Uh, it was a billion dollars, which I believe was the uh, most expensive like security infrastructure for any uh, G20 summit. Uh, there are 18,000 police from all over Canada. Um, and they started about a year before the summit organizing the security for it, which included uh, forming what was called the Joint Intelligence Group, which was made up of uh, Ontario Provincial Police, which is like the equivalent of state police, um, Royal Canadian Mounted Police and Canadian Security Intelligence Service, which are both sort of similar to FBI, um, and a number of local police organizations. Um, and early on they started infiltrating organizations in southern Ontario that were doing organizing uh, in the lead up to the summit. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, and I'm going to talk about a few things around, a few things that are explored in greater depth in this which I would encourage you to pick up, which is on the back table. Um, part of the context for this massive security operation um, is that there were several mobilizations in Canada in 2010. Uh, before then, the slogan, Riot 2010, was being thrown around a lot. Um, do people like remember this sort of, these things going on? Um, earlier that year, the Olympics took place in Vancouver. Um, there was... That was an interesting mobilization in that there was a very specific anti-colonial uh, focus for it, which I think is unique when it comes to these kinds of large mobilizations. Um, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, but the actions against the Olympics in Vancouver were like fairly large, fairly confrontational, and this was just a few months later, and it was going to be sort of like the next confrontational like large action. So the cops were, you know, they were freaked out about what was going to happen. Um, on our end of things, in Toronto, uh, there were two main sort of organizing bodies. One was the Toronto Community Mobilization Network, which did not plan actions. Um, they were like really broad-based. They coordinated like housing infrastructure, things like this. Um, there was a week-long mobilization around the summit, and there would be days that were like specifically geared towards like indigenous issues, um, women's issues, things like this on each day. Um, there was also Southern Ontario Anarchist Resistance, which was formed with collectives from throughout Ontario and I think also Quebec, um, that was planning specific actions. Um, the largest of which was going to be the Get Off the Fence March. So the actual summit itself was going to take place on June 26th and 27th. On the 26th, um, there's going to be a very, very, very large labor march. Um, but as labor marches are wont to do, it was going to uh, not go anywhere near the summit. They had a permit. It was going to go in a circle. Um, 
So Soar was planning something called the Get Off the Fence March, which was going to be a very confrontational breakaway from the large labor march on the security fence. Um, I'll go back. That's the security fence. You can It's black and white, but it surrounded the convention center in downtown Toronto. And that was a point that a lot, a lot, a lot of people in Toronto really did not like about this summit, is how disruptive that was. There were like checkpoints all over downtown, things like that. Um, so the Get Off the Fence March intended to march on the fence, and I think the stated goal in the call-out was to humiliate the security apparatus or something like this. Um, so that was, that was the plan. Um, the morning of the 26th, the Joint Intelligence Group raided some houses and started arresting people who were involved with SOAR. Um, over the weekend, 20 people would get arrested on conspiracy charges. I'll talk more about that in a second. But those raids kind of set a rather ominous tone for the day. Um, and what you're seeing here is something that I think is interesting. Um, this is the No One is Illegal contingent. Uh, no One is Illegal is a national migrant justice network in Canada that is really interesting. I would encourage people to look into them. Um, it's made up, mostly, made up mostly by and led by people who are undocumented. And they, after these raids, um, asked that they could like march with the Black Bloc um, so that they could be like protected, right? This is something that's very interesting to me and sort of unthinkable in the U.S. context. Um, and there were a couple attempts um, during the march to actually go south towards the fence. Um, they like would run into riot cops and it was like impossible. Um, so after some debates, the march instead uh, went into a commercial district. Um, oh, and one other thing about in terms of the block, the black block, I know as illegal marching together, is it's somewhat reminiscent of something that happened during the Vancouver Olympic mobilization, where there was an indigenous women's march that was attacked by the police, and they asked the black block to like get in front of them and like do defense. Sorry, what's a black block? Black block is a tactic where everyone would cover their faces dress all in black in order to be as indistinguishable from each other as possible so that you could do things that are uh, extra legal um, <laughs> and be less identifiable by the police. Uh, it's mostly associated with like anarchist movements. Um, sometimes it'll involve like property destruction, uh, fighting the police. Um, it can also be like purely symbolic. Um, does that seem like a fair assessment? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Does um, that make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so they couldn't go near the fence, so they went into a more commercial district, including an area that would be sort of equivalent to, like, Wall Street, um, and it was great. Everybody had a great time. Um, <laughs> the, there was a picture in the bottom right, but I don't know how to operate Mac computers, so it's not there. But, yes, it was very, it was very good. Um, people fought the police very hard for a long time, huge amounts of property destruction. I don't remember the actual figure. Um, and it went on for a very long time. The police had like totally concentrated um, all their efforts towards like defending the perimeter of the convention center and like the downtown core. Um, so this was able to go on for a long time. And while this was going on, um, despite the constant liberal protestations that like these kind of tactics like alienate everyone, more people come out. Like I think that when police cars are burning, people often tend to want to go there and burn more police cars, uh, which is what happened. Like, I think, like, three or four police cars got burned. All two of them were from the block. The other one is people who just, like, went out in the street and saw a chance to get revenge. Um, so people really took over the street for a very long time. Um, it eventually dispersed, and as far as I know, there were no arrests during the Get Off the Fence march. So nobody gets arrested while this is going on. Uh, the police don't even really go near it until the very end. But after this disperses, what the cops do is attack absolutely everyone else. Um, so this isn't like the permitted protest zone. This is in Queens Park, which is where people are supposed to be. Um, the police just attacked everything over the course of the next two days. Um, it was the first time that cops in Toronto have ever used tear gas. Uh, there were overall... 1,113 arrests. Um, 
they almost all entirely on like bullshit charges that would be the equivalent of disorderly conduct here, you know, or they'll pick everybody up, hold them for three days until the summit's done, and then let them go with like no actual like conviction or penalty. Um, they held everyone at the Toronto Film Studios, which I think in a second you'll be able to see in the background, but they converted it with like chain link cages and all that shit into like a holding center. Um, this is a jail solidarity demo. You can see like in the background, the Toronto Film Studio thing. This is right outside there, a jail, jail solidarity demo. I think the 27th that got attacked. Um, I did get arrested, um, not during the get off the fence march, but at something similar to this, like a smaller action. Um, an interesting lesson from that is that it's a good idea to quit while you're ahead because while a lot of people got picked up on charges and were released from there within a few days, they had everybody's photos, things like this, legal names, address, like, you know, all the things that the cops take when they bring you in. Um, that will come into play later. Um, <laughs> but like I said, there were 20 people who got arrested on conspiracy charges in that period of time. Uh, three of them were released almost immediately. Um, the other 17 people had like sort of a long, drawn-out conspiracy case. Um, the overlapping charges that they all had were conspiracy to assault police, conspiracy to obstruct police, conspiracy to commit mischief over $5,000. Um, the Crown, this is what the uh, prosecution is called, uh, the Crown asserted that since they were planning to disrupt the summit, um, that's how they were going to do it because presumably that's the only way you can disrupt a summit, I suppose. Um, after about a year, six of them took plea deals. Everybody else got off. They did a really, really, really good job of negotiating it in such a way where people who had, um, people who like, didn't have papers, people who had prior convictions, people who had kids, like whatever the reason, <laughs> weren't the people who went in, which is really interesting to me that they were able to like negotiate that. Um, again, I would strongly suggest this. Um, and one line that's very interesting to me that's in this, and there's a little bit more in it in there, is that the repression was explicitly targeted at three overlapping sectors of the resistance, anarchists, indigenous solidarity organizers, and migrant justice organizers. Um, this is kind of the thesis to everything I'm going to talk about in some way, that I think that nexus is really interesting and is apparently really threatening to the state. And so if they think it's threatening to the state, I think it's something we should want to pursue. Um, there are specific reasons for this in Canada, I think, in that these three sort of uh, movements or communities um, are particularly combative, um, particularly indigenous sovereigntists um, in Canada. Like, armed standoffs happen like in fairly recent memory in Canada, like 1990, 1995, if people followed like the Mi'kmaq blockade in Quebec like last year, things like that. Um, it's extremely combative. Um, migrant justice organizers, I mentioned no one is illegal earlier. Um, they're fucking great, extremely combative. They have like shut down airports to prevent deportations. They're also explicitly anti-colonial and anti-authoritarian. Um, and anarchists are anarchists. Um, there's a very good book, speaking of no one is illegal, and this intersection. Um, one of the people who got arrested, who immediately had charges dropped, uh, was a woman from who lives in Vancouver named Harsha Walia, wrote a book called Undoing Border Imperialism, which I think is really, really good and explores these things and talks more about no one is illegal. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about this nexus is that all three of these uh, spaces or communities or movements necessarily in some way challenge the legitimacy of the state. Um, whether it's because of uh, like a historical memory of living without a state, whether it's um, the fact that like you have crossed a border and you're insisting that human dignity and freedom is more sacred than a national border, or if you have an outright opposition to the state. In some way, they all challenge the legitimacy of the state. And I think that them working together, combined with being combative together, it's something we should really look into and explore more. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah. So one of the main reasons that I went up to 
this summit in Toronto is because I had already for a while been involved in No Borders stuff and like immigrant rights stuff and I had like knew some about No One Is Illegal. I wanted to like see that going on. Um, but now I'm going to talk about some of the uh, border work that I've been doing before this and that I still do now that's based in Arizona. Um, do people here know about No More Deaths? Really? Okay. Um, hopefully this isn't going to be too redundant for too many people. If it is, well. All right. So border militarization, the way that we know it today or think about it today, um, is relatively new um, in terms of like, you know, border walls and like massive surveillance buildups. Um, started around 93 and 94, um, starting in like Texas, San Diego, and Southern Arizona. Um, this is the same time that NAFTA was passed. Um, so there's an interesting corollary there. Um, the rationale, well, what they were doing was building up security infrastructure and fences specifically in urban areas. So like between Tijuana and San Diego, between Juarez and El Paso, um, in both Nogales is in Southern Arizona. Uh, the idea being that they could funnel people into this kind of terrain. This is what the desert looks like. I guess that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize when people talk about crossing the desert. It's not flat sand. It's like extraordinarily mountainous terrain like this. Um, extremely rural. Um, but the rationale is that they would force people to cross in these areas and either they wouldn't even attempt that or some people would die and then that would act as a deterrent. They alternately, in like early INS documents, INS is what uh, ICE used to be called, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, used to be Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, they alternately in their documents call it either prevention through deterrence or death as a deterrent. Um, so this is intentional, um, the results of which are fairly predictable. Um, these are, that's kind of light to see, but that's the year of the known deaths. Um, lots of people die crossing the desert. This is only in the Tucson sector, so only on the border between uh, Nogales and California, so like the western half of the Arizona border. Um, since 94, they've also increased the number of interior checkpoints. Um, there's been nothing but more agents. For a time, there was a lot of National Guard. Um, but the border pushes farther and farther north. It's not like a line. Um, crossing like the line is not the hard part. It's getting past this like growing militarized zone. Um, they've started using a lot more drones in recent years, things like this. And the result of pushing the actual like space that one needs to cross farther and farther north is that it continues to become a deadlier trip. Um, so the third column is the number of apprehensions in the Tucson sector, which is consistently falling, which one could take to mean that they're, that's generally used as like a measure of how many people are crossing that area. Um, but on the fourth column, this is the death rate, which is the number of people who die in relation to the apprehensions. So it's getting more and more dangerous to cross, largely as a result of that like border moving farther and farther north. Does that make sense? Any of clarifying questions? Um, I'm going to get some maps so I can sort of, and this is just a chart of that. <clears throat> um, this is a map of like the general area. I'm actually going to stand up and do something. So um, the spot where No More Deaths mostly works is sort of like in this corridor. Um, there's a ro this is a highway that goes north from the valleys to Tucson. There's another road <laughs> here, more or less. Um, that goes through Aravaca and connects to the 19. Um, there are right now, and you can't see the roads just because of the projector, um, there are checkpoints here on Aravaca Road, there's one here on 19, and there's one more or less around here on the road that goes north from Sasebe. Um, what that means is that rather than go, I don't know, somebody could walk a little bit up here and like be able to get a ride as recently as like 2007, at this point, people have to like go farther and farther in order to like get picked up, get to some kind of relative safety. Um, there's a lot of interesting resistance to these checkpoints going on in different parts of Arizona right now. 
um, for a lot of reasons, one of which being a situation that it forces people who are crossing into, but it's also remarkably disruptive for people who live in these areas, like they are living in a militarized zone. Um, Nowhere Guess is based just outside of the town of Aravaca, like that's where the camp is, um, and residents there have been organizing to shut down the checkpoint for about a year and a half now, I think. Um, it's a very small community, I think, I don't remember the number, um, but I think a third of the residents like signed a petition to shut it down, um, and they've been organizing against it. There's also, so this is all donut and land um, that is occupied. Uh, there's a mountain that you can't see right here, um, and west of there is the donut and reservation. Uh, predictably, uh, Border Patrol harassment and violence is more severe on the reservation than it is in Aravaca, which is predominantly white. Um, there's been some organizing against the checkpoints on autumn land as well. Um, and organizing against the fact that it's an illegitimate border that's dividing their land, right? Um, and I, there's some stuff in museums, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, this is a rough map of how long it takes to watch the, to walk that distance. Um, I don't know what time period this is, but the red dots are known deaths. Um, should also point out that it's assumed that the actual number of people who die is much larger than the number of known deaths because of the way that uh, bodies decompose quickly in the desert um, and the fact that it's a rural area. There are a lot of there are remains that will never be found. Uh, so that gives you an idea of that. Um, does anybody have any questions about that end of things yet? No? All right. Um, so, no more deaths. No more deaths started in 2004, initially as a coalition, now it's a much more established project. Um, it partly grew out of the sanctuary movement. Do people know about that at all? Um, this was a movement in the late 80s and early 90s um, that was mostly churches, people of faith. A lot of people were really influenced by liberation theology, which was sort of like a, if not Marxist, then like far left, like Catholic movement, especially in Latin America around that period of time. Um, but the sanctuary movement came out of a reaction to the fact that people fleeing dirty wars in particularly Guatemala and El Salvador um, where there were military dictatorships at the time and like civil wars um, could not get asylum in the United States uh, because the US was funding those military dictatorships so the rationale is no you can't be a refugee we're funding them we wouldn't fund them if you were being persecuted for like being a labor organizer being indigenous things like this um, so a number of like People of faith um, organized to provide people sanctuary in churches that eventually escalated to directly like getting people across the border um, into these churches. Um, that ended with a series of um, arrests and felony charges for human smuggling, things like this. Um, some of the people who founded No More Deaths had like done time in that movement. Um, so it began as a coalition with people from like sort of that background, um, immigrant rights organizations that already existed in Tucson, and anarchists. Um, it's continued since then, and it's sort of taken a different form now. It's much more established. Um, the four projects that I can think of that are sort of central, um, and anybody should feel free to correct me if I'm leaving something out, uh, would be Desert Aid. Um, this is a picture of a camp that's maintained that's maintained outside of Arabaca. It's about 12 miles north of the actual border. Um, from there, we go out regularly, leave water on trails, um, try to find people, try to generally offer food, water, medical aid, clothing, um, things like that. Um, and I don't know, this is kind of, some people might think this is interesting. Uh, the way that the trails work, like they are well-defined trails in the desert, um, but it's sort of like, it's a lot more like a network or like a web, like the trails weave in and out of one another, so we'll generally try to find like a spot where like 
don't know, maybe there's a canyon or some kind of choke point, so like a lot of trails will come together, and then you can like leave a lot of things right there, and then that's the way that you maximize the number of people are going to be able to get them. Um, also, people just walk into camp a lot and will like get water and things like that. Um, people often ask about their relationship with Border Patrol, considering that we're doing this. Um, camp has been raided a few times. Um, there haven't been any criminal charges as a result of those raids. In 2006, um, that was a point where we could still transport people north if they like needed to get to a hospital, and that was also before the checkpoint existed. Um, but in 2006, two people got arrested on human smuggling charges for trying to drive someone to an airport, or to a, to a hospital. Um, and there was like a big campaign in Tucson to get the charges dropped under the slogan, humanitarian aid is never a crime, um, which was one, like the cases, the charges got dismissed, but the judge made it very clear that that did not set a precedent. Um, I think the language was like, you had reason to believe that like, you had an understanding with Border, border Patrol that this was like an acceptable thing to do, to like do medical evacuations like this. Um, those arrests like shut down that like reasonable assumption. So there's no precedent, even though they got off, that like you can drive someone to a hospital. Um, yeah, Border Patrol surveils the camp. You will run into them, but sometimes, um, sometimes they're assholes, sometimes they're not. Um, whether they are or not has nothing to do with like the systemic role that they're uh, fulfilling. Uh, fuck them all. Um, <laughs> Other projects um, in Nogales and Agua Prieta, which are two border towns on the Mexican side, there are um, places where people who have just been deported can receive aid. Um, so like the same things that one would get in the desert, like water, medical aid. People often, after being in Border Patrol custody, um, haven't gotten these things, haven't gotten food. Um, also like letting somebody there use a phone, like people from southern Mexico don't know Nogales, you know, things like that. Um, and other things. I haven't been as involved in those projects. Um, abuse documentation happens both in the desert and in Nogales and Agua Prieta and other places. Um, that project revolves around documenting abuses that people have gone through at the hands of Border Patrol, either while in custody or in the desert. There have been two reports released so far, which are on the No More Deaths website, and there's a third one forthcoming, I wanna say in December. I could be wrong about that. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's very bad. Um, people are like verbally abused, denied food and water, denied medical care, um, physically attacked, um, they're, is documented like sexual assaults at the hands of border patrol agents, things like this. Um, and I think it's important to think of those things not as aberrations, um, because that's not what law enforcement violence ever is. Um, but in this situation, it serves um, a similar function that forcing people through this kind of terrain does, which is that it makes the trip, like the, the like, the whole experience of crossing as difficult as possible, as humiliating as possible, as emotionally, physically, mentally, like devastating as fucking possible, but it's definitely possible. Um, it just very much raises the cost of what it would mean to get deported after going through this. Does that make sense? Um, people are not going to risk making this trip, again, getting deported and having to make this trip again. Um, when it's this fucking difficult and violent. Um, does that make sense? Well, to clarify, that's the idea of the policy. It doesn't work. People just yes. end up dying and going through all these things. Yeah. It does not work, and it, but it does shut down the possibilities for like certain things on the interior in terms of people who have gone through this also, or at the, at the very least, disincentivizes them. Um, And also, another thing right now is that um, you notice the um, dropping number of apprehensions. Um, something that's definitely happening now is that a much higher percentage of the people who are going through here um, are people who are not coming for the first time, but people who have already been deported and are trying to go home. Uh, the number of deportations under Obama has like, totally skyrocketed. 
to the point where it's, I think, it's over 400,000 a year, I think. Um, so it's a lot of people who are going home and being forced through this gauntlet again. Um, another project that was started in 2010 was Rechazamos al Racismo, or We Reject Racism, which was the first sort of like political organizing effort that No More Debts got on board with. And this was in response to SB 1070. Do people know about SB 1070? Okay. Um, maybe. Yeah, I'll just talk about that right now. Uh, SB 1070 was a state law that came about in early 2010. Um, the sort of centerpiece of which was that it would require police in the state to inquire about people's immigration status if they had reasonable suspicion to believe they were in the country illegally, and then call immigration if you know they came back that they were in the country illegally. Um, there's a lot of organizing against that, um, some of which I'll talk about later. There was a federal injunction put on it um, immediately after it was uh, supposed to go into effect, which was in June of 2010. Um, since then, the injunction was removed, so that is now state law. Um, that campaign was to organize against that. Um, that didn't change very much in Tucson because within 100 miles of the border, um, Border Patrol, like, that's their jurisdiction. Um, and so in Tucson, there was already plenty of collaboration between local police and Border Patrol. Um, but it's like codified now, and that's especially severe in other parts of the state that are more than 100 miles from the border. Does that make sense? Um, does anybody who's spent time down there have anything to add? I had a brother who's slightly browner than I am. He got pulled over and yeah, he his ID's and everything else. And it's, yeah, it's the bullshit of having to through that. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to like emphasize what this looks like is people are getting uh, pulled over like at like routine like like seatbelt tickets or like just like really like small things. Yeah, like, I don't even like, think he was actually disobeying. I don't. I think he had a seatbelt on. He was speed limit everything, mm -hmm. and they still pulled him over. Isn't that the thing? They uh, they can just stop you for whatever. Yeah, if you just like, immediately give consent just by operating a vehicle, like you've already signed over consent by law. For them to pull you over, question you, or search you at any given time, especially in Salt Lake. Yeah, the, to finish that thought, um, it's okay. Uh, the the it means that people are getting pulled over for like routine traffic stop type things that like I'm sure we've all been pulled over for, and then like immediately being like handed over to border patrol and like being like put into like deportation proceedings. So it's like people are just like getting. It's and uh, this has been happening in Tucson like since before SB 1070 passed. Like SB 1070 just like legalized this, but also not only does it the way that it's phrased is particularly upsetting because it not only like legalizes collaboration between police and border control, but it like mandates it, and which is essentially racial profiling. And uh, so it is mandating essential profile uh, essential. <laughs> it is mandating. Racial profiling and collaboration between police and border patrol, and what it looks like is people being separated from their families really suddenly in terrible, like just out of nowhere. Well, it also blurs the line between the military and the police further than we already have blurred it. Mm -hmm. um, border patrol are technically a military agency. So it's Military is down there as well. I know yeah, Mexico, exactly. And Texas, National Guard and everything else. So it's just yeah, and it had like it very much changed like the climate throughout the state. Like as much as people were getting like handed over to Border Patrol in Tucson, it set like a more like severe and intimidating climate even in Tucson. A lot of people like self deported. Like that's part of the strategy of these kinds of laws. Um, but I'll talk more about that law in a minute. Um, and then the other thing that I guess I'll just talk about that now, um, there is like resistance to that collaboration happening, um, especially since uh, last October um, something awesome happened. Uh, not last October, October of uh, 2013. Um, 
So a lot of organizing in Tucson around like immigration stuff happens out of this church called Southside Presbyterian, which is one of the first churches um, that started offering sanctuary in the 80s. Um, so there are like a lot of meetings there, like, a lot of people like having a meeting. Sometimes there will be like 80 people having different meetings in that building. Um, and two folks who uh, work with a project in town who don't have papers were driving away, like around the corner they got pulled over because I think the, the light above the license plate was out. Um, the cop called Border Patrol. Uh, one of the people in the car was able to like call somebody inside. So immediately everybody comes out, they start calling more people, and like a hundred people like surround a bunch of cops and Border Patrol to like stop them from being able to leave with these people. The cops had to use like had to like hit people, um, use pepper bullets, pepper spray to like disperse the crowd, and that kind of thing is starting to be like more regular. Um, there have been at least like three or four times where like people have like gotten a call, a bunch of people go, people are like crawling under border patrol vehicles. Um, it's not working in terms of like stopping any of these actual uh, apprehensions, um, but it is making it a lot more difficult for the police. And border patrol to like just do these things smoothly, um, and hopefully it you know makes a cop think like okay if I decide to call border patrol am I going to have some sort of like confrontation if I do that? Um, so those things are happening. Um, and also in terms of sanctuary stuff in Southside, at least three times in the past year. Um, People have publicly been given sanctuary in churches after receiving a deportation order. I know twice of which it resulted in a stay of deportation. So that's working slowly um, on an individual level. Um, all right. So I'm going to jump back. Well, this section is called. You know, you spend like four months rioting and they just like don't want to let it go. Um, because I also got arrested for something different before I got arrested for the G20 stuff. This is a very confusing timeline. Um, but I'm going to kind of go back to that nexus that I was talking about and some examples of that happening in Arizona. Um, do people here know who Joe Arpaio is? Okay. I'm often very surprised that people don't. Um, so, Joe Arpaio is the sheriff of Maricopa County, um, which is the county where Phoenix, Arizona is. Phoenix is the largest city in Arizona. Maricopa County is the largest county, and it's, like, fucking huge. So, he's in, like, a relatively powerful position. Um, and he's made it really a thing where he wants to, like, just attack undocumented people as much as fucking possible. This is the outside of the jail the county jail in downtown Phoenix. Um, those are like massive doors. Um, he's known very much for having like, he has the tent city. He's the one who makes people like wear the pink underwear and like pink handcuffs. It's like a strategy of like attacking masculinity um, and trying to humiliate people. Um, so this is what his jails look like. Um, they're a real piece of shit. Um, there's been a lot of organizing in Arizona and some national attention um, just generally against him because of these things, which is problematic in a few ways, one of which is that uh, Phoenix Police Department is actually responsible for substantially more deportations than Arpaio. They're just smarter about it by their logic. Um, so it leads to some interesting situations. Um, in early 2010, there was a march against Arpaio that was organized by like some nonprofits in the area. Um, and, and they were cooperating with PPD, uh, Phoenix Police Department, to like facilitate the march, things like this. Um, and along with like that criticism and also criticisms of like the comprehensive immigration reform narrative, um, there was the DOA block, which is Diné Autumn Anarchist block. Um, Diné is um, the like correct term for Navajo folks and Autumn um, are the original people of what's now like most of southern Arizona, and anarchists are anarchists. Um, so there was this block in the context of like this very large march that really wanted to um, 
first of all, challenge collaboration with the police department in the course of the march, and also challenge um, the way that comprehensive immigration reform gets talked about. People have heard this phrase, yes, comprehensive immigration reform, uh, which universally uh, trades status for some people who are already in the country um, for increased militarization on the border. Um, universally, like every single iteration has revolved largely around increasing border enforcement. Um, it's also problematic in terms of like how it talks about uh, like criminality, um, but that's another, that's another thing. Um, so there was this block, it was very interesting, it was pretty confrontational um, in tone, um, and it was attacked by the police. Um, I think this might point back to why that, to that nexus being like threatening to the state. Um, Phoenix Police Department attacked it, people involved with the nonprofits collaborated with them to point out particular people, five people ended up with felony charges as a result of this. Um, this was shortly before movements against 1070 started really coming together, and this sort of tendency uh, participated in those movements in interesting ways. Um, there was in Tucson a lockdown at the Border Patrol headquarters um, that also tried to very much center militarization on indigenous land in the same way that the DOA block had done earlier. Um, there was a lot of criticism, like a lot of the 1070 movement was really trying to be like like appealing to the federal government to like do an injunction, which they did, and it did nothing. And the federal government was people deporting people anyway. Um, so that happened. Um, and then there was another action um, in November of 2010 uh, when people found out that the National Socialist Movement was planning to do another march in Phoenix. Do people know who the National Socialist Movement is? Um, they're a neo-Nazi organization. Um, but they were rallying in Phoenix against the federal injunction against SB 1070. So they were like doing this rally in support of that law, which is interesting when you look at some of the personal relationships going on. So Russell Pierce was, until recently, or until a few years ago, um, a state senator. He was the primary sponsor of SB 1070. So he was the person responsible on the legislative level for bringing this like up for a vote. Um, he was friends with J.T. Reddy who was a member of the National Socialist Movement, also founded one of a few organized border militias that exist in Arizona or have existed. He was once a sheriff's candidate. Um, these two were friends, like I think, so Russell Pierce was like a prominent member of the Mormon church in Arizona, and he like helped bring JT Reddy into the church. They like have history. So this Nazi leader is organizing a protest against the injunction of the law that this guy, that his friend, who's a senator, sponsored. People see this as being something that one would not like. Um, also, JT Reddy in 2012 killed four others and then killed himself. Um, he's a fucking psychopath. Um, so they were going to have this rally in Phoenix in November of 2010. It was actually the second time that they had done a rally in Phoenix in two years. Uh, the first time was around the time that that movie Inglorious Bastards came out. People remember this movie? About okay. no, killing Nazis. Um, so at the first one, there was like this giant, really well-made banner that was like printed photos from the movie of like Nazis having swastikas carved into their foreheads and being <laughs> shot. And it was like marching on the Nazis with this. Um, and people wanted to fucking do it again. And it was like the same kind of crossover between Diné folks, Adam folks, and anarchists um, who were like doing this. Um, the result was sort of a shit show. Um, the cops were like marching side by side with the Nazis. There were points where like it would be like cop shield, Nazi shield, cop shield, Nazi shield. And you like wouldn't be able to differentiate them. They had like hand signals that they were working out together. Um, and people fought back like rather hard for Arizona. Like this was very confrontational for Arizona, as you can see. Um, So that happened. And then there were some arrests afterwards. Um, I like that person using the skateboard to shield themselves from 
after Poland. Um, before the march, people in Phoenix are very good. Some people in Phoenix are like very good at like really like researching the local police and like knowing who undercovers are and things like this. So before the march, there were some people walking around with things like this um, and just like outing <laughs> undercovers, and it worked really well. But for it to work really well, you have to get all of them. And they missed one of them who apparently had been following, who says he was following me around the whole time. So I get arrested after the thing on six counts of assaulting an officer, one count of rioting, which would have been like a really terrible worst case scenario. Um, I fortunately got bonded out of jail after only like three days. And a week later, the charges were scratched, which is a weird phrase that they use up there that just means that like they're not pursuing them at the time. Um, but this was my first experience going into like general population, like not getting arrested during the course of a large mobilization or something. Um, and so I was thrown into, how much do people know about like racial dynamics in prisons? I know, yeah. <laughs> um, would you want to talk about that? Or should I just? You can go for it. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I went in, I don't like, Prisons are extraordinarily segregated, and it's an interesting form of segregation. Um, it works in favor of prison administrators to like have people at odds with each other. Um, so while it's sort of like people are self-segregating, like when I got in there, like you know, the white guy comes up and he's like, "Oh, hey, Wood," and I'm like, "I don't know what that means." Um, but they're like, kind of take me under their wing, you know? I got some guy who's introducing himself as freak who has like SS tattoos all over his hands, and I'm like, "Holy fuck!" Um, but like while I was in there, uh, there was an interesting thing that happened where the, the white crew like really, they really wanted to have a meeting. Um, and the, the COs, the, the guards, facilitated opening up like the rec yard so that the white people could have this meeting outside of the time when that normally would have been open. So like prison administrators understand that they like want this kind of self-segregation to be happening. Um, so there was like the white meeting, which they just terrible process. Um, <laughs> and the whole time, I'm like fucking freaked out because I don't know how I'm going to be in there. Um, and I'm wondering when the newspapers are going to show up saying that I was in there for throwing shit at Nazis. <laughs> but fortunately, I got out. And it was fine. Um, but that definitely was the first time that I thought seriously about... Um, how I might want to prepare myself for those racial dynamics if I were to go in again in the future. So this is something that was on my mind in the uh, the coming year. Um, do you have anything that you would want to add about that? Mm -hmm. Just that a lot of times you really don't have a, a choice. It's just you're, you're brought in there and you have to sit at the, the white table to eat. You have to watch TV on the white TV. It's not like there's an option to not be a part of that racial dynamic. It's, so it kind of really sucks. <laughs> yeah. And it also, another thing that occurred to me then is that, so you go through a space where like that's normalized, right? And think about how many fucking people go into prison. Think about how many people come out of prison, have like lived an experience where that is totally normalized and are now living in the society where like, it's normalized in a different way and how those things feed in. I don't know, that's something I think about it sometimes. Um, so this charge gets scratched and I'm like, oh, that's, okay, great. Um, and we start sort of continuing, trying to figure out ways to like engage from like the space of that tendency. And we eventually find out that, um, let me make sure I'm on track, yes. We eventually find out that this, this organization is gonna have a summit in the Phoenix area called American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, there's a zine about them. There are only a couple copies of it, um, but there should be some on the table. Um, has anybody heard about this group? Yeah, they are a lot more well-known, I think, now than they were four years ago, which is great in some ways, obnoxious in some other ways, but whatever. Um, but what they do is they've been together since like the 70s. They're a conservative nonprofit that brings together state legislators and private members, so corporate members, um, and they draft model legislation. So it's a mechanism by which 
uh, corporations can write legislation that state legislators bring back to their home states. Um, it's free for the legislative members to join, and the cost for corporate members, I think, starts at like $5,000, something like that. Um, interesting. Uh, they have a history with the prison industry. When they first started, they were born into like, like, like culture war kind of thing, so like a lot of like abortion law came out of there, or they tried to, but they like focused on those sorts of things. Um, that started to shift in the early 90s. Um, a lot of like corporate members are in the prison business, so Corrections Corporation of America, which is the largest private prison company in the country, is a member. Uh, there are other companies that are like implicated in different ways. Um, like, so AT&T provides like, phone service for prisons. They're a member, and they've like, been involved in passing. Some legislation that has led to greater incarceration rates, like truth and sentencing, three strikes laws, um, and as they were doing this, prison rates like skyrocketed, and the companies who stood to profit from it did. Um, Russell Pierce, the senator who sponsored SB 1070, sat on the same task force as Corrections Corporation of America and some other conservative organizations, NRA, National Bail Bond Coalition. Um, and he had been trying for a while, before 2010, to like get SB 1070 passed in Arizona and was like absolutely unsuccessful until he brought it to ALEC, got backing from these companies. 40% um, of the state legislature in Arizona is a member of ALEC, so it just like that's like that's how it was made possible was by like getting corporate backing, getting everybody on board, um, and then it passed the year that he brought it there. Um, yeah, we can do that. Um, which is a similar way that prior legislation had passed, and also after 1070, um, there was sort of. Like a number of similar bills spread throughout the country. I think particularly Alabama and Indiana had like this extremely harsh immigration law that like mandated cooperation between police and immigration enforcement. Also in Utah. And Utah. Um, okay, so here was that termed as like copycat legislation? Yeah. 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 It came from Alec also. Yeah. yeah. So like over a third of our yeah. state legislature yeah. are Alec. Too, yeah, so. yeah. So it was like not that people like saw what was happening in Arizona and were like, "That's a good idea. We want it here." It was just coming out of the same yeah. fucking place. Right. Um, so we found out that they were doing a summit in Arizona, and the same group of people like or that same sort of tendency planned a mobilization against it. I know that there were some Salt Lake folks who went down for that. Um, it was not the most wildly successful. Mobilization ever. Um, <laughs> but we did find out that they were very concerned with this. Uh, there's this particularly a DHS fusion center uh, based in Phoenix. Uh, made this, provided it to people doing Alex security, both private companies and the police. They failed to destroy after event. Um, <laughs> that text up there reads, committed assault on police officers. Um, and when I was going to a meeting like maybe a, two weeks before the Alex summit was going to happen. Yeah. Um, and we got pulled over on the way to the meeting in Phoenix for running, allegedly, or rolling through a stop sign. Um, but it was interesting because normally when you get pulled over for rolling through a stop sign, they don't um, tell you they recognize you. <laughs> Immediately have 12 other cops on hands. Uh, start taking photos of everyone in the car, asking people if they're anarchists. Maybe they do. Um, or, in my case, telling me, oh yeah, there's charges from a year ago, oh, well, we brought them back. So they arrest me on like the fucking Nazi charges that were supposedly done. I go in, get bailed out much faster this time, thanks to wonderful people in Tucson. Um, but now I'm facing like these six and a half like felony charges again. Um, so I kind of stick out of the mobilization, um, which was fine. It like continued trying to like draw the connections between like immigration enforcement, border enforcement, 
indigenous resistance and like anarchist resistance. Um, this is what happens. It's, um, I think it's interesting that since then, um, Alec is a lot more well known. I think it is often a little bit problematic in that I think a lot of people seem to think like Alec is the problem now. And it's like, oh yeah, if we got rid of Alec, they're behind everything. It's like with the Koch brothers, it's like, yeah, that's that's the problem. It's not. They're like one mechanism in many. Um, so, um, so anyway, I, uh, I'm back up on these charges and I'm facing it for a few months and I just take a plea in July of 2012 to like one count of disorderly conduct and it's not a big deal and I get three years probation. And um, after that, I just kind of go on with my life. It was a very close call, I'm all sketched out, not really throwing down so much anymore. <laughs> and I think I'm fine. And then in February of 2013, I was at my house one night and I'm like on the computer and I'm like, duh, 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 duh. and um, it's late, it's like 12.30 or one or something like that. And I have this email. And somebody's like, hey, Somebody sends me this email, and they're like, hey, uh, Joel Batar got arrested at his house. They were like, federal marshals, and they arrested him on like 26 charges, and they're trying to like extradite him to Canada. And so my response is, fuck. And so I'm like, okay, I, have, uh, I don't know what to do. Oh, uh, shit, what do I do? And I'm like, well, I gotta get out of the house. And I'm like, okay, I gotta pack a bag, I'm gonna get out of the house. What are some things that I need? Like, I, okay, I don't wanna leave my computer here. I'm bringing the computer here. I put some clothes in the bag. I'm like, okay, what else do I need? I put in like a bunch of beer, and I like <laughs> I go to a friend's house, and I'm like, fuck, 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 fuck. What, 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 what do I do? This happened, and I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, and there was a moment where it was like, okay, well, do I fucking flee? Which is like an interesting thing to consider because I think often when we're getting arrested, we don't um, we, we don't have the, that kind of forewarning, right? So it was interesting to me that that was like on the table at the time. I decided not to, and I'm glad I did. I would be like in Mexico City right now, which would be fine, but I'd rather be in Tucson. Um, <laughs> but I think those are interesting questions to, like, to think about. Like, okay, how, what are other ways of like dealing with repression? Um, and this scene we also have in the back. Uh, it's called Running with the Devil, and it was written by one of the people who... Um, was going to be subpoenaed to a grand jury in the Pacific Northwest, was uh, perhaps fortunate enough to know, to like figure that out ahead of time, and fled to Canada. Um, so I don't know, I think that one's interesting. Um, and those are things that we should think about. Um, I'm really not interested in being like, yeah, running is the right way to do. Anything else, you're just cooperating. Like, I don't think that's true. Um, but I think it's good to like think of as many options as possible, um, generally. But I didn't flee. I like stayed out of my house for a few days, and then they're like, well, what the fuck am I gonna do? And so I started staying in my house again. And I remember one night, um, it snowed in Tucson. It was just like a week after I found out about Joel getting arrested, and it snowed in Tucson. It never, ever, ever snows in Tucson. Like, this is very rare. And I remember thinking that night, well, there's no way they're gonna come tomorrow. It's fucking snowing. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that tomorrow. That's fucking insane. Sure enough, they fucking come <laughs> that morning. Um, so yeah, the house gets raided. Uh, there were, I think, like 15 or 16 U.S. marshals there. They like come in with the guns and all that. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're actually adding you on this. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they raid the house. They put me in a car, they drive me to this federal courthouse, which another thing that I'm going to talk about in a minute takes place. Uh, they like drive me around the back, uh, they finally like show me the actual warrant, and it says that these are the three counts. It's one count, it's like, well they tell me that these are the three charges. They say wearing a mask with intent to commit an indictable offense, mischief over 5,000, and mischief endangering life. And each one of them next to it has a number, and I ask the guy, is this the number of counts? And he kind of looks at me, because, you know, they're like, the long numbers. And he's like, wait, fucking, no, this is the, that's like the section code. I'm like, oh, wait, okay. Um, <laughs> and, and then I'm like, wait, so it's one count of each? And he's like, yeah. And I read through the thing, 
and it's like a very detailed thing about a Starbucks window. I'm like, wait, they're going to extradite me for one Starbucks window? Or like, oh, they have to be, I only work here. Or something like that. Um, they also... Uh, so we like park around the back of this building, um, and the, one of the marshals like gets out of the car, and has anybody seen The Matrix? Do you remember Agent Smith? <laughs> that guy gets in the front seat of the car. Um, and he introduces himself as, like, Mike... Well, no, at first he won't introduce himself. He's like, oh, what, Mr. Rossman? He's got, like, this thick file. I'm like, you fucker. And I'm like, what is what is your name? And he's like, don't worry about that now. And he's like, you know, he's like, oh, we can make this easier for you. He specifically asks about Florida and New York. Um, and I, like, had been shaking my head from the moment he sat down. And so I was eventually like, all right, you're not going to cooperate with me. But it only took a second. Um... But that happened later the, um, in documents from like where that, the DHS fusion center that that face sheet came from, uh, this agent was like really prominent in them in like doing surveillance in Tucson and the next. Um, so, so yeah, I'm in jail for this. I get denied bail uh, repeatedly. Um, after one bail denial, some friends put out this statement, which I found out in doing this talk in other places isn't as funny, because I guess transience isn't as like severe a problem in other anarchist <laughs> communities as it is in Tucson. Um, but I get denied bail over and over again. Um, we did early on... Actually, I'll talk about that next. Um, so I get denial, denied bail the first time, and they bring me to Central Arizona Detention Center, which is run by Corrections Corporation of America. And I'm going in here having flashbacks to the Maricopa County Jail, and I'm like, God damn it, I have to talk to white people again. Um, well, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Okay, like, okay I'm going to be in a situation where I'm expected to strongly identify with whiteness again. Um, but it turns out that that's like not the fucking case at all, um, because nearly everyone in this facility um, is in on immigration related offenses, um, probably like 90, 92 to 95% of the population there is Mexican, um, a lot of indigenous folks also, and then like very, very, very few white folks or black folks. Like I only ever had to hang around like two other white people that I even like saw. It was a really peculiar racial makeup, I think. Um, but which was like, as weird as it is to say, like, that was fine for me. Like, you know, once people were like, oh, you speak some amount of Spanish and you do weird border things, that's at the very least novel. Um, <laughs> and it created another situation where, um, so, like, to talk more about racial dynamics in prison and ways to, like, potentially undermine them or resist them in a place where, like, you don't have a choice and where, like, this identification with whiteness, if not with white supremacy, is, like, totally expected. Um, there was a point where, so like the people from Mexico in there were like running Paisa or Paisano. Um, and I was like offered, like halfway through the time that I was in there, I was like, oh, you should just be like running Paisa. Like that's who you're hanging out with anyway. And this was especially brought up when like one like white power foot guy like did end up moving in like next door. Um, that would have been a very, very, very interesting approach, I think. Um, I did not do that because it carries with it a lot of baggage. But that would have been, like, a very interesting affront to, like, white supremacy in there. I don't know if you have that information. Because um, it's horrifying. Why, um, why were you offered? Because, memory? like, because almost everyone that I was, like, friendly with um, was Mexican. Um, people generally, like, thought that what I was in there for was, like, fine. Um, there were also, I mean, there were people in there who, like, small talk would sometimes be like, oh, yeah, I know that trail. Oh, yeah, the Baba Kibri Ridge Line trail. Yeah, I use that all the time. Like, shit like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, that was going on. Um, and they also, like, at some point I told some people, like, oh, yeah, I've been in before for, like, this anti-Nazi stuff. I don't want to hang out with that guy. And people would be, like, receptive to that. Like, people were always close to it. I was very lucky that, like, like, my first cellmate was, like, really nice guy from Arbor Creek that would, like, lived in Tucson for a long time. Um, like, I was very lucky. Like, that's often not going to be the 
case. Um, but again, just thinking about ways to engage with certain things when we're in impossible situations is something I'm interested in exploring. Um, and I've sensed, like, with some prisoners who I write with, have heard that it's, like, fairly common for every, like, racial gang or, like, entity, whatever you want to call it, um, will often have members from outside, like, whatever race they allegedly are, except for white folks. Interesting. But anyway, so a lot of people were in here for immigration charges, particularly because of a project called Operation Streamline. Um, this is another program, or this program is based out of that courthouse that I showed you a bit earlier in Tucson. Um, it only exists in a few parts of the border right now. It started in 2005 in Texas. It moved to Tucson like five or six years ago. Um, and the idea behind it is to criminally prosecute as many people who are apprehended by Border Patrol as possible. What happened before this project um, was that if somebody got apprehended by Border Patrol, they'd be in detention for like some relatively short period of time, like maybe a day, and then get deported just south of the border, and they would be able to like try again. You know, um, what happens now is that, and it's don't understand exactly how it's organized because they only have capacity to put so many people through this program. Right now I think it's 70 people every weekday, but it's like, they'll like have this like moving zone where it's like the first 70 people who are apprehended here are going to go to streamline. So it's like really arbitrary. Um, and they get criminally prosecuted, uh, or they get charged with either unauthorized entry or if they have a prior deportation, unauthorized re-entry. Um, for first offense, you'll generally get like a 30-day sentence. That can go up a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, if you have previous deportations, or especially if you have a previous deportation and a criminal record already, then the sentences can get substantially longer. Um, the way that the hearings were done, I believe this changed fairly recently, but for a while they were done like en masse. So like 30 people would come up and it would, they would answer in unison. Like, do you understand the charges? See, how do you put it? Get it. Um, I believe that's different now. Um, one of the big criticisms against Streamline in like more like liberal circles was that like, oh, that's not justice. Um, I'm not a fan of that argument and don't feel differently about the program now that people have an extra 10 minutes with a public defender and, <laughs> and like, are coerced into pleading guilty one by one. It's the same fucking thing. Um, and there you can see the graph in terms of uh, people sent to prison on immigration charges skyrocketing the year that it was implemented in Tucson. Um, uh, there was another thing that I wanted to say about that. Oh, another thing that this does is make crossing the desert more perilous because the risk has now gone up if you are apprehended. Uh, before this program, it wouldn't be uncommon for us to like run into somebody in the desert and they're like, I'm lost, I don't know what to do. Like, yeah, I'll call Border Patrol be in Nogales in a couple of days and try again. Now, like, that can't happen uh, because you don't know if they're going to end up doing jail time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's raised. It's another thing along with, like, checkpoints. Like, really good. Um, this is another thing. This is an action on the top where we were trying to think about ways to directly intervene in border and immigration enforcement before the point where people are apprehended. So like, you could surround a border patrol vehicle, maybe that'll help, maybe it'll just make things really uncomfortable for the person who just got arrested. Uh, what we did here, and this is actually on a National Day of Action against uh, corporate ALEC members, that was in 2012? Yes, that was in 2012. Um, we blockaded the bus depot that's operated by a company called G4S. G4S is a global security company. Um, they do security infrastructure in the West Bank for Israel. They like run some Israeli prisons. They um, run, I think, some detention centers in different parts of Europe. And in southern Arizona, they operate the buses that are used to transport people from the desert to border patrol stations or to courts and then four deportations south. 
Um, so we blockaded the bus depot early in the morning in the hopes that this would interfere with their ability to like apprehend people that day. Like if they don't have places to put people, they can necessarily like apprehend fewer people. Um, after about an hour of this, they cut down their own fences, which is a very interesting thing for a global security company to do. But they cut down their fences to get the buses out. So, you know, it wasn't wholly successful. It was, I think, definitely a step in the right direction. That's interesting to me. Um, more recently, about just about a year ago, there was an action where, as the buses that were run by G4S exited the freeway to go to the streamline hearing, people blockaded them on the like on the frontage road, getting off the freeway. So on these two buses, there are 70 people who are about to go to streamline. That seems like a very problematic thing to do, to like force people to be like trapped on a bus, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was very well thought out in that this was on a Friday. Uh, that next Monday was a holiday, and if somebody hasn't had an arraignment in 72 hours, they have to be deported. Um, which is hard to call a victory, but this was the first time that Streamline ever got shut down, and almost none of the people on these buses were criminally prosecuted. They were rather just deported. So this action stopped 70 people from going to prison, which is fucking rad. Um, I think 16 people were arrested. At the same time that this is happening, the federal courthouse is also being blockaded by other people. Um, 16 people got arrested. Um, a number of them were recently found guilty but haven't been sentenced yet. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I'm sitting in Florence at this point. And somebody comes to visit me a few <laughs> days later and they're like, oh, yeah, like a bunch of other people are getting extradited too. I'm like, holy shit. Um, so I found out that there are five people who have been arrested with an eye towards extradition to Canada. Um, the largest number of charges being Kevin Chianella, um, the smallest number being myself and somebody named Quinn McCormick. Um, everyone else um, waives extradition, which means that they voluntarily went to Canada, and they were able to, largely as a result of like waiving extradition and voluntarily going there, get bail once they were up there, and then like be able to go back to the states. I think some people had like house arrest and things like that, but they like didn't stay incarcerated. I did not do that, which wasn't, again, this is not because I was trying to be like, no, fuck, I'm not going to cooperate with you assholes. Um, it was largely because I couldn't fucking get bail in the U.S., um, but I also very early on, through like my public defender, who I got very lucky to have a good public defender who was like enthusiastic about the case. Um, knew that we were looking at a plea deal of probably like six months. Like that's what the Crown wanted. Um, and in Canada, you serve uh, two-thirds of a sentence normally, and then if there aren't any problems, you get out at two-thirds. Um, so we knew that I was realistically looking at four months, and that it would probably be better to just do that in Arizona, where I was like close to support networks. Knew that I was in an all right position in the facility, and um, just like get it over with. Um, like everyone else like went up, got bail, and then months after I was out, had to go in after taking place, you know. Um, so it was a decision based on those lines, not because I'm like a more pure, non-compromising anarchist monster. Um, <laughs> so, and we also like figured like, okay, well why the hell no, you can try to fight extradition. Um, and try to get bail a few more times. And I try to get bail a few more times. It never works. They won't do it. Um, finally, I have like an extradition hearing in April. Uh, we lose. They decide to extradite me. Um, the judge gives me a lecture about how someone could have been killed. Um, <laughs> and I spent another two months waiting in Arizona to get extradited. They move me at like the last possible day that they can. Um, because they, after like the extradition hearing, and after you're like, yeah, you're going to be extradited, they have two months to do it. They did it on like the last fucking possible day. Which ended up being great because that means that I served the full four months in Arizona. So I was going to go there and like probably get time served. Um, so they like, you know, they wake me up, they're going to move me. They, uh, the 
uh, guards like drive me to Phoenix, they like, drive me to the airport, I'm like, back in my regular clothes for the first time in a long time, it's great. Um, and there are these two uh, Canadian police who are, well, they're detectives because all of the surveillance that went into um, like all the cases after the G20, they, it was mostly uh, murder cops, so like homicide detectives, and most of like the photo and like video analysis was done by people who normally work on child pornography. So they took all of those people off of those projects for several years, which I think says something about uh, what, what the police exist for. Um, and it's not to keep us safer. Um, so I meet these two homicide detectives, and they like put me in handcuffs. And I was wondering if this was going to happen on the flight, and it actually does. And I'm stunned that they. So I'm in the handcuffs, but they put a hockey jersey over the handcuffs and just walk around, and we just walk around like, like nothing's going wrong. <laughs> and it was actually the best flying experience I've ever had because we didn't have to go through security. We were the first people on the plane. We were the first people who got to get off. It was really comfortable, except for the fact that I was handcuffed and uh, going to jail. Um, so that happens. They bring me to like, the station, and they tried to interrogate me, and they did it in an interesting way, um, especially one of them. Like once I was like, I'm not answering any questions. They tried very much to like um, challenge my masculinity, and they were very like, what, "Why'd you do it?" Like I don't want to answer any questions. So like, be a man. And they're like, don't. Um, and they're, like, Fuck. And they're, like, man up. You look like a scared little girl. And I'm like, I don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> which I think says two things. One is that they had spent years and years and years researching anarchists and thought that that was the best approach. <laughs> um, but which might also say something about, like, another, like, side note, which shouldn't be a side note, but, like, yeah, we do need to fucking take gender politics seriously because our other enemies, like, know that we're fucked up and they're going to exploit that. Um, so, like, if you won't, like, work on gender stuff because you fucking should and because we're interested in total liberation, at least do it easier. At least do it because it, like, makes us easier for the cops to hurt. Like, come on. Um, why misogynists make great performance is a very good scene, but I don't have copies up here um, that touches on those things. Um, what else did they do up there? It was a weird place. Um, there, that was another space where, like, so I, like, moved into, it was, like, a county jail. It was way less comfortable than the prison in Arizona. It was, like, a city jail. Um, way more, like, violent, both on the part of, like, inmates and guards. Like, the guards were more, like, city cops. Um, the food was way better. Um, but, like, the second that I went in, somebody was like, where are you from? And I was like, Arizona? And people were like, shit, I saw you on TV. That's fucking great. Like, I remember when the cop guards were burning. That was fucking great. And I was like, I didn't do that. And they were like, you should tell people you did. <laughs> um, and so I end up getting offered a plea. Well, oh, yeah. And I only get, was able to get extradited on two of the charges because in order to be extradited uh, on a charge, it has to be illegal in the place you're being extradited from. Um, and masking with intent to commit an indictable offense is not illegal in Arizona do anything in the mask. Um, it's fine. Uh, so I got uh, extradited on mischief over 5,000 and mischief endangering life. And apparently in Canada, it's, and I seriously doubt that most lawyers like follow up on this, but apparently attorneys there are not supposed to help you plead guilty to something that they don't think you did. Um, so the attorney that I had, who we got hooked up with through Guelph ABC and who had done some other G20 cases was like, no, I've gone through the evidence. Like, Mr. Endangering Life, like, even if you wanted to plead guilty to that, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> and apparently the prosecutor, the Crown, was fine with this. And um, so I pled to one count of mischief over $5,000. Um, and the Crown was comfortable with, like, me getting sentenced to, like, one day, which is the equivalent of time served. Um, I had to agree some, to pay $1,500 in restitution. Um, that was an interesting negotiating thing because, well, first they had the wrong number because it was the wrong Starbucks that they were looking, that got smashed up, that they were like using their numbers on. But then there was like this interesting thing where it's like, well, in this thing, there were like five people attacking that store. So whatever the total damage was, you have to divide it by at least five. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> um, 
of which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, but then the other thing is that um, they can't, it was like, it's unenforceable. Um, like, it's not like, an extradition order is like purely civil, so there are like no, cons- as far as we can tell, no consequences for not paying that. So we did. Um, <laughs> And the judge is like, okay, fine, like, yeah, and when it was being explained to the judge, which I don't remember if they're judges or what, they wear the wigs, um, <laughs> it was being explained to him that, like, oh, I, yeah, we couldn't extradite him uh, for uh, masking with intent. He says, oh, well, that's Arizona, like, you can wear a mask when you rob the stagecoach. <laughs> that was it. Um, <laughs> so I get uh, one day, and I'm like, oh, this is great, I'm going to... I get to leave now. I don't. I get to get put directly into immigration custody, um, where I spend a month waiting to get deported, and I have to go through a series of, like, really, um, I'm going to say it, Kafka-esque hearings, <laughs> where they're like, this is a bail hearing. And I'm like, I don't want, okay, what, I, I don't want bail. And they're like, well, we don't think we're going to give you bail. Like, Why not? And it's like, you're a flight risk. And it's like, because I'm going to, because you're going to go to the U.S. And it's like, that's, that's what you're trying to send me. <laughs> yeah, we have to send you there. And I'm like, I, I would just go there, though. And they're like, yeah, we can't give you bail. I'll just go there. And I had to go through that, like, three or four times um, before they finally, like, deported me. And it turned out they were waiting for, like, for one other person getting deported to the U.S. to, like, be ready because they didn't want to use their van to transport only one person. <laughs> um, and so I got dropped off in Niagara Falls. <laughs> which I've never seen before. Um, um, yeah. Um, also, immigration detention in Canada is interesting and horrifying. I don't know as much about it as I would like to. I would again recommend that Harsha Walia book. Um, things are as fucked there as they are here. Um, there were definitely people I was in there with who, especially uh, folks from Somalia, who for whatever re- for whatever reason, like. If they committed a crime that made them inadmissible to Canada, they're like, get put into immigration detention. But Canada won't deport to Somalia, so they're, like, stateless. So people have been there five years, six years, shit like that. It's as fucked as it is here. Um, I get out, and then... Oh, this is the <laughs> courtroom sketch of myself. <laughs> um, it's not a very good way. Um, nor of the, the attorney. Um... And then in February of 2014, everybody else who had been out on bail uh, pleaded guilty um, to varying numbers of counts and sentence lengths. Um, Joel gets 20 months, Kevin gets 24 months, and because of the sheer number of charges, is the only person who gets sentenced to federal time. Um, Richard uh, gets seven months and has to pay some restitution. Um, the other person who had been extradited very early on was like, I don't want to be connected to like energy support, so I'm just going to take care of this myself. Um, which is fine. Um, at this point, everyone is out except for Kevin. Um, I am going to pass around a bucket in a second because I do want to, if possible, try to get some cash together for him. Um, he is going to be out in a few months, I believe. I would need to do some math to figure out exactly when because I don't um, so, yeah, that's what I had figured out to talk about. Um, does anybody, what do you want to talk about? So, did they get pictures of me? Yes, yeah. that is, yeah. yeah, that's worth talking about, and I should have done that. Um, and I meant to bring, like, the enormous thing of discovery. Um, yeah, I got caught. A uh, combination of like sloppiness on my part, um, just the massive surveillance that existed, like on the part of the state, and like citizen snitches. So, like after that riot, um, the cops set up like a Facebook page, like soliciting photos that like thousands of like good Samaritans fucking like submitted things to. Um, it was like huge um, and disgusting. Um, 
Yeah, they had dozens of photos, um, both during that and the day before, outside, like a couple blocks away from a place where there was a meeting. Um, they like got photos of me there, um, and over the course of two years, were able to like from thousands of photos, they were comparing like um, people's boots that they had other photos of to pictures of people from the block, um, pictures of people's glasses, pictures of like absolutely everything. Um, they they had some things about like a person's gait like written in the thing, but it didn't seem like it was anything particularly like, useful, came out of that kind of thing. Um, the fact that I got arrested well after the riot on a different charge um, is how they had my name and my face. Um, or how they had my name attached to my face. Um, yeah, um, I had often thought about, like, you know, yeah, you go do something, like, get rid of those shoes. Um, at that time, I was, like, relatively inexperienced. I wore the same shoes that I was planning on getting rid of after the thing uh, in the days before. Um, that was sort of the, uh, that was sort of the clincher. Um, Another thing, something that I've thought about a lot, I wonder if black blocks make that much sense during the day, generally. Along the fence, so to speak. <laughs> um, In what regards? Um, I don't know, it just seems so much easier to get caught during the day, like, because no matter what, no black block is anybody actually going to be like, entirely dressed the same. It just seems really risky in terms of, like, cameras being everywhere, surveillance being everywhere, that it seems like it would be harder to do with things that were dark. But also, eh, it works a lot of the time, um, out, especially outside of the context of like this kind of summit. Um, I also, another thought that I have that people ask about a lot, I don't know if this like sets some sort of precedent. I kind of don't think so. I'm often skeptical about looking at like what happens at one mass mobilization and thinking like that's the new normal, because I think at least a few times we've seen that it isn't. So like after the 2008 RNC, I think a lot of people were kind of like, um, okay, conspiracy charges for everyone from now on. Um, but since then, there have been like a lot of similar mobilization, or at least a few, where that like hadn't been the case. I think that what happened in Minneapolis and what happened in Toronto is sort of similar, and that I think um, local cops were like throwing temper tantrums. Um, Cops did not like the fact that they were able to spend a billion dollars and have 20,000 cops on the street. <clears throat> and people were still able to like riot for hours. Um, they apparently didn't like that. <laughs> Can you talk a bit more about the black block tactic and maybe why people engage in targeted property destruction? Would anyone else want to talk about that? I think I had said enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> there are a few different approaches to it. Um, I don't want to favor one or the other, and I'm sure there's some that I'm not going to think of. Um, well, no, I will. The one that I'm most interested in is, so you know how people talk about how like those kinds of tactics are like alienating. You know? um, they're talking about alienating to very specific people. Um, people who are like somewhat invested in this society continuing to exist, um, I think. Um, I think that a black bloc can appeal, and like some of those tactics, like property destruction, I guess is mostly what I'm actually talking about right now, um, will appeal to like another set of people, um, people who like are not at all invested in this system continuing, like at all. Um, as much as like smashing up shit might like alienate like some liberals somewhere, like. Marching in circles with like a permit is alienating to another group of people who are like pissed off and like really want to like, and perhaps this is like in aimless ways, um, but I think that's valid, uh, like bite back directly um, and hurt them in ways that like, I don't know how much that's gonna like lead to the rev or whatever, um, but I don't have any answers about what would, and I think that it's still worthwhile if it like feels good to hurt them like one day, like that's great. Um, yeah, um, and also in terms of, aside from just property destruction, it's useful for like, I mean, just from like the defensive angle, 
like if I <clears throat> don't want to get shot with rubber bullets, it's good for me to be able to do things without being at death. Um, yeah, I would, uh, at, uh, like, a recent experience in Tucson, uh, where we both lived, there was a, there was a collective police march after the Ferguson stuff. It was very small, um, uh, but the flyers and everything said, you know, like, like wear black, bring a mask. Everyone at the march was masked up. The only thing that happened was taking a street, which isn't that confrontational, but Tucson isn't very confrontational in general. Um, a lot of cops showed up and, like, did not like that we had taken the street, and uh, we were able to... We were able to evade them and, and avoid anybody getting arrested, but at other events that had happened where not everyone was masked up, they just arrested people afterwards, and that didn't happen this time. And I think that was because we wore masks uh, and, 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 ever, and everyone was in black. So I think it can be useful even if you're not trying to do something like totally crazy, like setting cop, car, you know, setting cop cars on fire or smashing windows. Just if you plan on doing something you know the police aren't going to like and you don't want it to be easy for them to get you later, it's something to consider, I would say. It's also, oh, oh sorry, that's not illegal in Arizona, it's also not illegal. Yeah. I'm just saying, it's also kind of a symbolic gesture, too, because so much of what police are there for is to protect property, and to destroy the property is to attack what they stand for. So, there's a really good, I've mentioned Tarsha Walia a few times, but after the Vancouver Olympics, um, there was some like backlash for a black block march that happened during that, and there's a debate between her and some idiot. Um, <laughs> tears him apart, and it's like one of like the most articulate like defenses and explanations of like black block tactics that I've ever seen. Um, if you like Google her name, like Harshamalia Black Block or something, it'll come up. It's like really good. And there's a zine that's based on that talk that looks like this. That is very good. The, and that more goes into like um, retorts to criticism of black lives. Um, a couple things that I didn't remember to bring up. Um, these two zines um, are very good. There are a bunch of copies of both of them. They're both really pertinent to um, the criticisms of like more like nonprofit immigrant rights organizing and. Um, uh, Conference of Immigration Reform and things like that, and one of them goes a lot into um, challenging the idea of like allyship in struggles. Um, yeah. So they're good. And also all the zines are up on the Tucson ABC website, and here are some websites for further uh, investigation. I was, I was just going to mention that um, here in Utah you can be charged with wearing a mask with the intent to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you can definitely. I've been I've been charged with it, uh, but they weren't able to prove that I intended to commit a crime, so they dropped it. And so I mean, but it is something to think about. So what if uh, we wanted to be a part of the camps um, helping out on the trails in Arizona? My, my family, a very racist grandmother, actually lives right in that Bowling Green Valley somewhere. Okay, yeah. Right down That's there. Annoying. So uh, <laughs> I plan on you know, spending some time down there. And how would we, could we help? Yeah. Help? Um, there are, nobody else is a strange organization. So for part of the year, particularly in the summer and for like a few weeks during um, the spring, it's like totally open. Like anybody can like apply to come down. Um, that's how we raise money, though. So like the idea is that you'll like offer some kind of donation in order to do that. There are like waivers available for that. Um, the rest of the year, the camp is still there, um, but it's mostly like local people or people who like people know well who like hold that down. Um, so yeah, the best way to like initially plug in is either move to Tucson and ingratiate yourself to people, or um, <laughs> go during one of like the open times. Um, there's information on the website. Um, I'd also under Nowhere Desk there are two websites. Um, I would suggest the first one for questions like that, and the second one for more like okay, yeah, perspectives that's... and things like that.
as someone who's not uh, from here, I'd be very interested in any reflections people had about, you know, really any sort of, but one that I've heard recently is that, you know, there was some, uh, like, some collective police marches after something got killed. So I'd be interested in any perspectives that people had about We've that. We've had a handful of police deaths here mm-hmm. recently. There's also. I was going to say that there there was some drama after uh, people did take the streets, um, mainly issues with communists and anarchists not getting together, getting along like typical. But <laughs> but definitely um, there was a difference of opinion in whether or not streets should be taken without people knowing whether like the consequences of that they can get arrested by doing so. Um, I guess speaking on that, so there have been kind of like a growing number of actions against the police in Salt Lake over the past, I don't know, year or two in relation to some kind of higher profile police killings in Utah. And they are going to continue. And actually, this Wednesday, it'll be two days from now, there's going to be a meeting um, at the Salt Lake Public Library sometime that you can actually can look it up um, with the group Utahns Against Police Brutality. Um, they kind of have, in the past, um, I guess, maybe focused really on being against police brutality, where maybe, like, I think the perspective of a lot of the folks around here would be being against police. Um, but I think that maybe by, like, being at that meeting and, like, trying to, like, make public, like, we're interested in supporting this struggle, but we come at it from this particular perspective, and we think maybe things like, you know, having a collective show of strength in the street are worthwhile and meaningful, and we help to do that sort of thing in the future, that, like, if we have that sort of narrative at that meeting, that that might, like, help some people in that organization either share that perspective or at least kind of, like, uh, bring to light that rift in a more productive um, way than just arguing over Facebook. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm going to try to be at that meeting and if other folks who were interested in kind of like maybe continuing that struggle or... or kind of really... This week you heard A Walk by Tai Chow. Right now you're listening to Preservation by Wu-Tang Clan. And as always... El Comandante's. Which side are you on? If you're a local artist and you want to get your music out there, hit us up. Yeah, we can always use music. If so, we if we if we like it, we'll use it. Uh, I'll use it even if I don't. Honestly, I don't like most of the music we put on. <laughs> but that's you know whatevs. But we do need your help, even if you're not a local musician or artist, and you've never recorded anything. What you can do is go to iTunes right now and rate and review the podcast. It helps us out a ton. And if you're not already subscribed, please also do that as well. You can also, if you want to do a double whammy, grab your neighbor's phone, grab your friend's phone, grab your family member's phone, grab your grandma's phone, just your mom's phone. Anyone, any new iPhone has the new podcast app, which means you can open up that podcast app, subscribe to the show and rate and review us. So uh, let's do those ghost rate and reviews and subscriptions. Let's get let's get those done. They help out the podcast tremendously. My dad asked me the other day, "Why do I have a podcast that's downloading on my machine?" I'm like, look at it. Oh, that's mine. I must have subscribed you. <laughs> you cheated. Yep, I did. So you can help us cheat too. <laughs> um, if we're not friends on social media, totally check us out. You can go to whichsidepodcast.com and click on the social tab. There's a lot of stuff that we talk about online that we don't talk about on air. Have we done anything with Google Plus yet? No. You, you just ignore that. Or Ello. We signed up for Ello. You can ignore that too for okay. now. But uh, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. Instagram. Instagram as well. And find out shit that's going on. Shit we talk about. Be our friend. Just be our friends. We like that. (laughs) 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 Fuck shit, damn.
Mm-hmm, indeed. Which side is produced by the Which Side Media Collective?